empathy and compassion and uh, our our desire is to, is to create a place where we can understand these things at a very rigorous neurobiological level. Um, I'm not a meditator. I'm not a Buddhist. I'm not even a systems neuroscientist, although some of my best friends are systems neuroscientists. But I'm a neuroscientist and a person, and I really see the idea that we could learn about empathy and compassion as really fundamental aspects of brain function, aspects of brain function that are uh, largely have been largely avoided, uh, very likely because we don't have the tools that we need or didn't have the tools that we need to explore them, but nevertheless very, very important pieces of brain function. And uh, if you read E.L. Wilson's uh, The Social Conquest of Earth, you'll realize, you'll read his view that empathy, the ability to read another's imp emotions, their thoughts, their ideas, were a fundamental aspect of successful uh, evolution of the human species. The folks that have been involved in our center so far, some of them are listed on the bottom. So what we'd like to see is a transdisciplinary effort that builds on the amazing strengths that UCSD and neurosciences, but well beyond engineering, uh, the division of biology, the department of philosophy, to bring people across schools and divisions together to explore the neurobiological basis of empathy and compassion, Experimentally rigorous, building and using new tools. Ralph referred to new tools. Certainly we need new tools. Um, and really exploring this whole notion of the brain basis of empathy and compassion using diverse groups of subjects, naturalistic settings, and the idea that not only is there a circuit basis, but that it's modifiable. So what do we know so far? The overview would be that empathy and compassion are fundamental features of human cognition that the field is just beginning to attract attention. The neural bases can be defined. It's a prediction, but I think it's a reasonable prediction, and that research can provide insights into mechanisms. That individual differences exist. I think you probably know this from your own experience. And the exciting thing is that it may well be able to modify, we may well be able to modify an ability of a person to empathize with another and to do it in a way that doesn't compromise their own sense of well-being. We want to build a rigorous neuroscience of these, these uh, mental states to enhance uh, lives and well-being. And we know that we need a diverse team of folks to help us do that. So a picture of the brain, three pounds, a little gym, what we do, what we think, what we feel, what we want to do, what we didn't want to do, what we're sad about, happy or not, who we love, we don't love, it's all in there. Brain is the organ of the mind. How do you understand the brain? To decipher the brain, you have to decipher the circuit basis of brain function. And understanding it then requires that we learn how they assemble and they operate, how they learn, how they remember, how behavior emerges from the activity of circuits and how circuit disorders lead to brain disorders. And our, our tools, while far from elegant, far from elegant, are nevertheless adequate at the moment to learn a lot about the brain. I think our tools are really good now at the level of genes and synapses and proteins. They're less good at the level of circuits, but we're learning about that. And certainly an emphasis at the circuit level, understanding how neurons talk to one another is an important thing. But it's really the case that the nervous system has this vertical integration all the way from genes to society and back again. And it's at that top level where so much could be accomplished in such a short time, admitting, of course, that we have to stitch it all together in time. We have billions of neurons in our brain and trillions of synapses. Uh, I, I, it makes me happy, although I don't really understand how they all work. Surely, our neuroscience is just at the edge, just emerging at the edge of an enormous wave of discovery to understand how circuits function. And some of those circuits instantiate empathy and compassion. Here are definitions of empathy. The first, the act of understanding, being aware of, being sensitive to, and vicariously experiencing the feelings of another. A compassion to voluntarily bear the suffering of another. Very reasonable definitions out of Webster's, but of course there'll be a new definition of empathy and compassion. New definitions that really relate to the function of neural circuits and how they're modifiable and how we engage them and when we engage them. And so just to briefly touch on what we know, recent findings allow for an early view, an emerging synthesis of what brain regions and, and circuits are necessary. To give you a little bit of a neuroanatomy lesson here, on the left, 
Notice that green band, that's the cingulate sulcus. And on the right, notice that green band, it's called the insula. And it turns out these brain regions are absolutely essential for the early view of empathy and compassion at a circuit level. Here's a very early study by Tanya Singer. And in this study, she's doing fMRI. She's measuring brain activation uh, in, in the context of a person, a woman, either seeing her own hand slightly painfully stimulated with an electrode or her husband's outside the scanner. And the question was, what areas of brain are activated? To what extent are they activated by the non-painful versus the painful stimulus? And to what extent are they activated in the person feeling the pain and the person seeing the other having pain? And those two brain regions, the anterior insula and the anterior cingulate cortex, are really beautifully outlined in these studies. I won't say too much about empathy for others, except that notice that those, those red areas overlap beautifully and intensively with the green. Empathy for pain in others is closely aligned, at least regionally, with empathy for pain in self. I won't mention the fact that women are much better at empathy for others than men, but it's true, and that came from this study. So what do we know? We know that these findings are hardy. They've been replicated over and over. We know that the activation of the insula is also seen in other conditions in which we're aware of our own feelings, our own internal feelings, our interoceptive sense. And the idea then that we instantiate subjective feelings in the anterior insula, and that that communicates beautifully with the cingulate cortex, both going forward and coming back, this is a critical circuit, critical network piece that tells us about our limbic sensory experience and also our limbic motor uh, uh, interests and engagement. So what we can say so far is that I can't stop quite yet, but uh, that existing findings are consistent and plausible. Empathy and compassion engage overlapping as well as distinct circuits. Compassion engages motivation and reward networks and research promises to provide unique insights to the mechanisms involved. We got our center founded in 2012. We were joined by many colleagues. We've had great talks, great group sessions. And we see the possibility of studies of empathy and compassion really set it, moving around the university. So for example, interaction with the medical school about circuit mapping, disorders of empathy and compassion, interaction with the biological sciences around computational neuroscience, translational studies, understanding through animal models what empathy and compassion might look like. In engineering, these important new technologies that we really have to have to explore these areas. With the Rady School of Management, uh, studies about uh, empathy and engaging in negotiations, uh, well-being and those who are dealing difficult situations, stressful situations, uh, optimizing management, and in the social sciences in so many different possible ways. So we're excited about the possibility that we might contribute through a center like this to many different schools and divisions in the university. So we don't yet know the circuit biology. We need to explore that. We need to understand how we can moderate circuit effects and how that might impact behavior. We need, need better tools and we need to understand how improve our lot. we might improve our lives by enhancing the biology of empathy and compassion. So this is what we wish to do and we're hoping that we'll get a chance to do that and again to have this be an effort that extends from the medical school to the entire campus, uh, not just for great brain science but for great engagement of others and, and for really a healthier lifestyle. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, we'll just have time, I think, for uh, one question here. I, I see one right down here in the front. If we could bring the microphone down, that'd be terrific. Uh, thanks, thanks so much. Yeah, that's good. No. You'll have to forgive me a bit because I'm an historian, but I, I find that this is, this is terrific. I find it fascinating. Um, in the split between the humanities and the sciences in the 20th century, empathy and compassion what became the realm for literature, yeah. and that's the place of sharing. Um, so, two questions. How do you get from brain functioning to the social implications? Does, do the humanities, the, the century of stories, uh, oh, how do you bring that into your work? Because, well. Well, I'm hoping you'll teach me. So that's the first right answer I'm to the question. I'm a historian, not a literature. The, uh, we tell ourselves stories. You know, what I, I see brain science right now in this domain as being able to link the things we think about 
with things that we can measure third person. That's such an important link. I want to talk with people who think about what they think about. And I want to understand those people and how their brains operate in the context of well-defined, carefully controlled experiments using better tools. The stories are in our brain. We'll see evidence of those stories in our brain. And we won't be able to understand the whole story. But we might understand those pieces of the story that say, I see you. I see that you suffer. I understand how you feel. That's the kind of beginning we need to make. I wish I had a better answer.